We are in 1 Corinthians, starting in the second chapter. As you're turning there, let me remind you how we get here. We started two weeks ago a new journey through the Scriptures by looking at the letter of uh, 1 Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul, who was also the first church planter to come into Corinth, establish the Christian community. And about five years after he went and preached the gospel and helped establish the church in Corinth, he wrote them a letter because he'd heard that there were some things they had to kind of work out now. It's been five years since the church has been planted, and, and now he's retroactively writing them to say, hey, I hear there's some stuff that you're thinking about. There's some disputing. There's some divisions. There's some arguing. There's some questions that you have about how this whole thing is supposed to work. So Paul writes this letter to help bring clarity to their church. And I find this letter so comforting because in my journey with Christ in church and the community of Christ and my own walk with the Lord, sometimes clarity is not always the season that I'm in. I can get distracted. I can get discouraged. I can get burdened. And if you're like me, it's nice to have the word bring my focus back to the Lord. So week one, we really looked at this letter to the church in Corinth and realized that Paul starts by saying the focus of every believer in every church must be Jesus. And from there, all other secondary issues will make sense. And then we looked last week at the message of Jesus glorified in the cross, the message of the cross bringing clarity to who we are. And today we're really going to look at one of the distractions that takes our focus from those things. And we're going to look at, starting in verse 1, something that Paul will now point out as what can be a replacement to the clarity of the cross. Starting in verse 1, it says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And here's why. Here's why Paul is writing to remind them how he came to them. His style and his method and the way he preached. He says, here's why it's so important to remember the beginning. Verse 5 will be the key verse of our study this morning. So that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but your faith should be in the power of God. And I find oftentimes when we go through the season where we can take our focus from Christ, take our focus off the cross, and be distracted by something else, we lose the power of God, and we look at all this other stuff, and it's going to cause division and disputing and discouragement and all of the other things that will come when you lose focus. And so Paul is saying, do not be distracted by the wisdom of men. And when you think about what he's trying to say in the context of the culture that he's speaking into, the season of their church, I want to try to put it into words that we can understand what was happening in first century Corinth. Well, it's clear that this church was living in a cultural context that if you've heard this city described, to give it a modern day comparison, it's almost like a Las Vegas the city of Las Vegas is this city where cultures come together and it's high on entertainment and it's high on fun and it's high on ideas and it's high on all of these things that will give you a, a flash experience. And it seems that Corinth was very similar. It's a port city with lots of money being made and the city had a reputation of enjoying to spend that money through partying and having fun. And it was also a city that loved, not far from Athens, the philosophy of the day. Not only entertain through revelry, but also give us all the knowledge that we could come up with and, and teach us what the wisdom of this world is. And Paul has to remind this church that they were not brought together saved by the power of man's wisdom. And in this, if we could use a word for our culture to describe the atmosphere of that church, which I also think will describe some of your church experience or the atmosphere of our 21st century church, 
I want to use the word hype. You guys familiar with the word hype? Let me give you the definition of it. It's the extravagant or intensive publicity or promotion of something. That's hype. And you can sometimes feel the world that we live in is always giving you this intense moment of promotion and publicity that you would look at something, give you an idea, give you a truth. And maybe the best version of that is on your bulletin cover this morning is the little device that we keep in our phone that at any minute, whether you're focused on school or work or your family, at any minute, the hype machine might come up and give you a notification or a vibration or a ringtone or a bell that says, look at this. How many of you, even this week, were doing something that you set out to do, and then the hype machine notified you that there's something you need to know about, and so you pulled out your phone and started looking, and it took priority, and your focus shifted from your work or your school or your family or the thing you were focused on to this news story that you needed to hear about, or this person that immediately needed to get your attention, or your friend's feed that came up and you didn't realize they were on vacation, but here they are. Or in all the other ways that we hype our favorite restaurants through reviews, hype each other through our dating profiles. We we hype the world that we live in and we're constantly looking around thinking, wow, what, what, what else is out there? What am I missing out on? Your phone is a hype machine and that's what it is. And the danger of this, and when church becomes a hype machine, or your experience with God is more of an experience with the hype about God than God himself, here's the danger. And it's another word that flows from the word hype, and it's the word hyper. And when you get a lot of hype, what you find is hyper people. Let me read you the definition of hyper now. It says, this is an adjective that makes someone hyperactive or unusually energetic. Here's it used in a sentence, eating sugar makes you hyper. Experiment for the parents as you leave church and you go to lunch. Let your kids pick what you're going to eat. Let them have anything from the store or your house. Let them pick cake because they will or cookies or whatever ice cream or fun sugary snack that you have. And you'll see what hyper does to someone or sugar does to someone. It makes them hyper. And when you're hyper, you have a lot of synthetic energy happening. And then very shortly after you crash, you become grumpy and you become upset or you literally just fall asleep. It happens with the sugar diet of our physical lives. It will also happen if you live in a spiritual diet of hype, you will be a hyper believer that's really excited and then Monday comes or trial comes or actual testing of your faith comes and all of a sudden your sugar diet crashes and you don't know what to do. And Paul, I believe, has noticed that this church is falling into some hype of the culture, and because of that, they're a very hyper church. And we know that by reading the rest of the letter. They're disputing basically about everything. Everything has become a big deal. Everything has risen to the top of priorities, and divisions and disputing can't be dealt with because everyone is hyper-focused on themselves. And so what Paul is writing to this church and what I receive so freely from the word for our generation of church is we got to remove the hype. We got to go back to just the simplicity of what we actually have in God. And it says in verse 5 that our faith would not be on the wisdom of men or the cultural values of the world that we live in or the hype machine, but our faith would be on the solid and sustainable and unmatched and glorious power of God. If, if we actually could get into the awe and the presence and a relationship with God that brought us power. Now that's a sustainable faith. To know the power of the one who created the universe with his word. Now that is a faith that will survive Monday morning. That is a faith that will survive the trials and the ups and downs that will come that a spiritually shallow sugar diet person will not sustain. And so how do we do that? In the first five verses that we read, Paul brings out onto the table a a retroactive look at the beginning of this church and points out three things in their founding that were completely unhyped, and he's calling them to return to the simplicity of these three things so that they can return to the power of God. The three things that we find in this is the completely unhyped message of the cross, We're going to talk about that briefly this morning, but we really emphasized that last week, so I don't want to belabor it. The second unhyped 
avenue that Paul wants to return this church to is the unhyped messenger. Paul says, I came to you. This is what I brought. Look at my example when I was your messenger. And then he says, a completely unhyped method of bringing it. So in the message and the messenger and the method, we find our battleground for the power of God and the hype of humans. And that is exactly what I experience sometimes when I'm engaging in the church culture that we live in. Sometimes it feels like, whether it's the message or the messenger or the method, that the hype belongs to the actual avenue of delivery and not the actual power of God. So we start with the unhyped message when we look at chapter 1, verse 17. And as I say this, I'm going to change the word that I'm using from unhyped to something that Paul continually uses throughout this letter. But I think it's getting at the same thing. What he's going to say is, the message is foolish. That's how non-wise and non-exciting and non-glitz and glamour this message is to the world that it was brought to, that it's actually going to come across as foolish. It's the opposite of hype. And he says that in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Within the gospel, Paul will say to the church in Romans, the gospel itself has the power. And then he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness. If you just think about the message itself, the proclamation that God made through the cross to the world, that he loves us and he has the perfect plan to reconcile himself to him, it's foolish to those who are perishing. It's completely unhyped to the lost world. To those who are dead in their sin, the cross makes no sense. It is not something that you can present to someone and have them say, well, I've been waiting to just do that with my life anyway. The cross is a foolish message, void of hype, because in the cross... For those of you who have not accepted it as the power of God, it's perishing. But those of you who believe by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, you see the cross and you realize that it is God's instrument to display his love to you. It's the power. It's the power of God. For, for some, the message is foolishness. But for us, the power lives in that foolish message. And I want to point out very briefly how foolish it is by re-examining verse 23 from last week. It says, we preach Christ crucified. Those two words represent coming together why the message of the cross is an absolute paradox that will always fly in the face of human wisdom. Those two words, Christ crucified. Now the first word, the Christ is actually something that the wisdom of this world can accept. The Christ in this, in this context, the, the Christ, simply means the Messiah, the coming one, the anointed one of God that will come as Savior to restore God's people, to bring God's peace, to bring God's justice. Now that sounds like the wisdom of the world, that you would hope that someone could somehow come as a knight in shining armor to make things that are going wrong go right. And the wisdom of this world is okay with the coming one. And that's why we are always looking for the next good king or good politician or person to come in and make things right. Or if you're a sports fan, you're looking for the next great quarterback or great head coach. Or whatever your avenue of seeing and touching with the perishing world is, you think, yes, we need someone to lead this thing. And if we found the right leader, the ship would be led well. Well, the Christ of the world comes. But the Christ comes crucified. Now that's where it becomes foolish. Who is waiting for the politician to come and to bring victory for the people, not through the political and economic plan, but by actually taking on defeat and death? and taking on all of the failure and absorbing it himself to be a model of death and then rebirth, that is where we have a foolish message, but it is the message of the wisdom of God. His plan is that his son would lay down his life so that we could have ours. The Christ would be crucified so that we could be made alive. That's a foolish message that is lost. Christ crucified? Listen to how one commentator says, the context for the first century audience must have felt. Preaching the Christ in the first century made perfect sense. 
Everyone was waiting for the Messiah to come to bring victory and prosperity to the people. But preaching the Christ crucified in the first century must have sounded like a contradiction of terms. It must have sounded like boldly declaring hope in frozen steam or hateful love or upward decline or godly adultery except much more scandalous. And I find, as much as I'm grateful that I understand by the power of revelation of the Holy Spirit that it is the cross of Christ that saves me, and it is by bearing the cross of Christ in my daily life that disciples me to the perfect image of his son, sometimes I'm like a first century audience where I'm like, yes, come into my life and then bring me prosperity and victory. Did you hear those two words? Everybody wanted the Christ to bring prosperity and victory. And if I had to bring this message into the 21st century church, kingdom of God people, this is how the cross of Christ can be made of no effect, that we would package the message of the gospel into a wise man's version for this world to make sense of it. Because it's much easier to say to you, here's the gospel, believe in a good God and you'll have a good life. Here's the gospel. Put your faith in a God that is faithful and you will have a blessed life. Is that true? Of course. But ultimately, the goodness and the blessing will never be fully experienced until we meet him face to face. And on the way to heaven, we're going to have suffering. And some of us are going to die of disease. And we're going to have all sorts of trials and tribulations where life gets really hard. And those are our cross moments. So we are not preaching prosperity and victory Now, always. And I'm grateful that we live in a culture that seems to be awakening to the reality that it is the cross, the foolishness, that it's the death and life of his son that gives us as an example to die and live for one another. That is the message. Here's the most recent example of it. Uh, You may have seen this in your Christian news feed this week because a very prominent prosperity preacher just had a small moment of repentance to to in his own journey towards Christ say, I think I might have been overemphasizing the victory and the prosperity. So I'm about to quote someone that I normally would never quote, and some of you who are worried about these kind of things might say, why are you quoting this preacher? Well, it's because he's giving us insight into bringing the message back to the cross. So I'm going to quote Benny Hinn. Everybody ready? Are your spiritual seatbelts on? (laughs) Good. This is what he said. He said, today, sadly, among a lot of circles, all you hear is how to build the flesh. He said, it feels, it's a feel-good message, and it's all about feeling good, doing good, being good, and making money, and all the rest of the blessed life, and I'm sorry to say that prosperity has gotten a little crazy, and I'm correcting my own theology, and I love what he says for the purposes of our verse this morning about the gospel. Here's what he says. It's an offense to the Lord to say, give $1,000. I think it's offense to the Holy Spirit to place a price on the gospel. And I'm done with it. In, in, in our economy of the wisdom of this world, everything has a price. It makes sense to put a price on the gospel. It makes sense to say, if you work hard and put faith in this and put your money here, then God will bless you. But we don't believe in what makes sense. We believe in the foolishness of the cross that whoever believes is saved apart from the works of the law. The gospel has no price tag, and that's the foolishness of the cross. The message is foolish to those who are perishing, and it is unhyped in its package because the only way that there's power in this message is in the power of God, not in the packaging of the message. I want to go now to the foolish messenger. But before I do, I I just want to qualify what I just said. Because we've spent two and a half weeks, partial moment of this sermon is to, to remind all of us that the wisdom of this world is perishing. Our only hope is the foolishness of the cross, which is the wisdom of God. And everything else will turn into nothing. Now, that could be interpreted if I don't bring a qualifier, which Paul also brings, as saying, just trust in the cross, and never mind all the intellectual stuff. Never mind all the pursuits of wisdom, because we have the cross. The cross is the beginning of all wisdom. 
the, the Proverbs say the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. In the cross, what we have is the foolishness of God, which is his wisdom, and it opens up our life to a pursuit of the knowledge of God. And that's why Paul qualifies this in verse 6 by saying, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. If you are a believer, please do not interpret this message as me saying, Never mind with the intellectual stuff, just focus on the cross. What I'm saying is, when we have the power of the Holy Spirit revelation of what the cross brings us and the power of God displayed, our whole life can go deep into the word of God and we become wise and instructed people. So please pursue that as believers. And if you're not a believer, the first act of wisdom of your life will be to finally see God's wisdom portrayed as foolishness in his plan to save you through the cross. Nothing else will work. Now we go to the foolish messenger, and it says in verse 1, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Now, the foolish messenger is something that will also be a temptation to allow hype to creep into the Christian community or the pursuit of God. And we see it in 1 Corinthians. What has happened to this church is Paul has left and some different personalities have come in that they really like and now they're disputing amongst themselves which camp of the personality do you belong to. And I have to say, to bring this to the context of where we live in the kingdom of God, 2019, sometimes it feels like we look to the messengers for the power. Sometimes the messengers who bring the proclamation of the power of the cross can be confused as the power in and of themselves. And that's why sometimes when you look around, churches can be drawn to the messengers. I, I like this church because I just love this guy, or I love this band, or I, I really enjoy their style of, of preaching, proclaiming, and his story is just radical, and his family is such an example. And Paul actually had to overcome a little bit of that on a 10 times bigger level in his own missionary journey. He had to overcome people thinking the messenger was the power of the message. Look what happens in Acts chapter 14. The context of this is Paul and his missionary friends are in Lystra, and they're bringing the gospel and its power. And part of the demonstration of that power that Paul is talking about, it comes with healing. Paul sees a man who needs to be healed, and he heals him. Now, if there's a moment for the messenger to get credit, it's sometimes when God uses the messenger to bring healing. Literal, spiritual, in your life, the messenger does something to show the power of God. And what happens? Well, here's a warning for us. It says in Acts chapter 14, verse 11, when the crowd saw that what Paul had done, the healing, they began to lift their voice. They said, the gods have come to us in the likeness of men. They looked at Paul and said, there it is. It's an incarnation of one of the gods, and they start trying to figure out which god it was. And Paul, of course, to back up what he's telling the first Corinthians, had to tell these people, don't worship us. We're just messengers of the most high God. Now, that's one example of Paul living out his desire for the messenger to remain foolish. But in the context of first Corinthians, he has the opposite problem. He, he actually came to them, and nobody respected him. In fact, it was after a long string of missionary challenges. Think about where Paul had come from to get to Corinth. He spent some time in Philippi. You probably read the letter to the Philippians. That's his time in Philippi is his touch point there. And what happens? The book of Acts gives us a little bit of his record in Philippi. It says when he was thoroughly beat, he was thrown into jail. The messenger was beat, thrown into jail, and eventually ran out of town. Also happened, uh, as far as him being rejected or, or run out of town, Thessalonica and Berea, still conflict in Paul's missionary journey. 
He goes to Athens and he brings the message of the cross and they scoff him and he leaves and he comes to, to, to this town in Corinth after three or four just, just tough and hard and beat up and spit on and scoffed at a line of events that bring him to Corinth. And then look what he says about his, his time in Corinth. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 6, it says, when they opposed and reviled him, Paul shows up to Corinth and he starts preaching in the synagogue and they essentially were against everything that he said and they didn't like it. And he shook off his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. I'm going now to the Gentiles. Paul represents a messenger that was beat, imprisoned, discouraged, lonely at times, frustrated at times, and the power was not in the messenger. It couldn't have been. His circumstances were powerless sometimes. And yet, what does he say? He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, the point being so that you could see a demonstration of the power of God. When you take all of the successes away and you remove the power that could actually be bestowed on the messenger, you're left with a demonstration of the power of God. That's a freeing verse for someone who preaches. And it's also a freeing verse for you because what this does is it allows through the power of the Holy Spirit so many more people to bring the gospel. So many more of you are now qualified to be messengers because you don't have to be the spiritually elite. You have to be the spiritually humbled to be a messenger. And now Paul will bring that idea to the whole church in Corinth reminding them that the qualification for the messenger is not that he's the most spiritually amazing person, is that he's willing to endure. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 9. He says, I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ. The foolish messenger. The foolish confound the wise. He says, we are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished. We are dishonored. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed and beaten and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure, being defamed, we entreat. Here's the qualification and here's the apologetics of God's wisdom in using broken messengers that really have only the power of God to bring to people in the demonstration of what they need. Is that when you find a broken messenger and they go through all of the trials of life to bring the gospel and they never quit, it tells you something about the power of the message. In fact, not long ago, I was, I was just researching the, the, the resurrection and just looking into everything that people say about why we can give such a solid defense to believe in the historical and bodily resurrection of Christ. We have the eyewitness testimonies. We have the gospels pointing us there. And one of the testimonies of the resurrection, the evidences, is that people always try to make sense of these disciples who gave their life for the message. The power of of the message was that these fishermen and disciples and people who abandon everything to live for it were willing to persevere to spread it through all sorts of challenging circumstances. And I believe that's the power in the 21st century message. For people to try to make sense of why the kingdom of God is still the light of the world, still the hope for humanity, why the cross is still being proclaimed by all of us who believe as our only hope, it's because for whatever reason, the power of the message is sufficient. And we can take a bunch of broken messengers and broken communities and broken churches, and it never dies because the message is so real. When you remove the messenger you bring power to the message. There's a quote by Francis Chan that I, I love so much for, for a, this type of season. He says, movements of God start when the founding people fall in love with God. 
And that's true of a movement of God that affects a family, affects a school, affects a revival in a nation. When, when there's a group of people who truly love God and they bring that message and it's just all about the awe and love of God, the movement of God will start. And then he says, the movements of God end when the people only know the founders. And isn't that what we see? We see people radically love God and proclaiming it through broken messengers and the awesome power of the cross and people accept it and then we get confused about where the glory belongs. And that will be the end of the movement. It is a foolish message and it is foolish messengers who bring it. And finally, we look at this, this last part, which is the foolish method. Look what Paul says. He says in verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words. Now the method is revealed in that because he says my preaching, and that is the message of bringing God's truth and God's power to the world. The message is that God raises up these broken messengers to proclaim it. And that's the way it was from the very beginning where people would raise up and thus says the Lord. Then John the Baptist shows up and says, this is what God is doing. And Jesus gives his spirit to people who would proclaim it through preaching. But the method of preaching can never depend on the power of persuasion. That's what Paul is saying. It was not the method of persuasion. And this contextually is important for this church in Corinth because if you describe Corinth as, a, as an ancient Las Vegas, Las Vegas loves to have fun and Las Vegas loves to be entertained and the entertainer, entertainers of Las Vegas are the very best in the world. There's no way that I could go to Las Vegas and hold an audience with, with my skill of, of, of opening up a, a, a sermon and, and being uh, the ability even now as I stumble and I'm like, how do I even say this? It's like, I, I'm not a master orator. And yet our world has them. And Corinth had them flowing in from Athens. In fact, uh, Apollos, who would be the pastor after Paul, was actually kind of known for his ability to do this. Look what it says in Acts chapter 18. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, and he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He came, and there's nothing wrong with being eloquent, but he came, and, and the people thought, yeah, that's what we like. We really, really, really like that. Here's the test of this for your own life. Have you ever showed up to church? You've been coming to a church for a while. Maybe it's this church, and you, you really get into the vibe of how the message is presented, and it just hits you the right way every week or, or every other week, every once in a while, and you think, I'm going to bring a friend, and you bring a friend, and you show up, and it's a guest speaker. I feel that way every week. <laughs> it's me again. And you know that little tiny thing in your heart where you're like, dang it. I wanted them to hear from the really good guy. I wanted, him to, I wanted them to hear from the one that's funnier or the one that's more persuasive is what we're kind of saying. And what Paul's saying is, never mind that. You think that the power of God coming from heaven into earth that has to break through the sin of a hardened heart and then ignite it with the power to live in the newness of life, you think that depends on the words of the person? It's a foolish method. Paul says, I didn't, come, I didn't, I didn't really have the orator skills. He didn't start with jokes. He didn't start with a clever intro. In fact, to give proof to Paul's orator skills... Acts chapter 20 gives us an example of Paul's style. And it's not necessarily what you'd want to tune in the radio to as you're driving to work. It says, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul was ready to depart the next day, spoke to them. He's giving like a farewell message. And it just so happened in this farewell message, he had a lot of good things that came to his mind, and he continued until midnight. So Paul goes way too long is what that's telling me. In our culture, we're thinking, we're looking at our watches, we're thinking about our day, but it gets worse. Uh, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. It's okay to go long if you're at least energetic and exciting, but he's going long and he's putting the audience to sleep. Homeboy's sitting in a window, he's like, is this guy almost done? And it gets worse. It, it, it says he was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. He's killing people. <laughs> he's so boring, he's killing people. 
He's so insensitive to their time that people are dying. It says, Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him. He said, don't trouble yourself, for his life is in him. Uh, this could be an indication that the man was saved. So Paul's like, the guy's going to heaven. Now, where was I? <laughs> Anybody else want to go to heaven today? <laughs> It's a foolish method. Paul turned the world upside down through the method of preaching the hypeless message of the cross by preaching through the foolishness of his own life and by preaching a method that would never make sense. And when you remove all of those things, here's what you're left with. Where's the power for your life? Where is the power for you to to have an overwhelming love for God that you can't help but worship and cry out to him? Where is your power in your spiritual being? If your power is that you have heard an amazing message that really amps you up about what's possible in your five-year plan and for your retirement, or if your power is that you have finally found a messenger or preacher or pastor or song that finally reaches you week by week, if your power is because you like the style you're going to be a hyper believer. You're going to be excited sometimes and you're going to crash sometimes. Here's what we need more than anything else. What we need as a generation is to overcome the hype of the message, overcome all the hype of the people who stand on these stages, overcome the hype of the things that bring us in that will just as easily take us out and say this in verse 9. I has not seen. Nobody's actually seen the revelation, the fullness of his glory. Nobody's heard the power, the goodness, the the reality. Nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those whom he loves. There is a revelation that will never come to you through your senses. But verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. We need an overpowering of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to just invade our lives and we would be so desperate for more of God. We need to be in love with him. We need to be in awe of him. We need to look at the cross and realize that God has made a definitive statement that he loves you, he's forgiven you, he's accepted you into his kingdom and there's power in believing. There's power in living it. And the the power of the Holy Spirit is the only thing that we can actually Count on. You can't count on the prosperity message or the great preacher to always be there. You can't count on the style to be exactly what you want, but we can count on this one simple truth. Jesus says, if you evil fathers know how to give to your children gifts when they ask, how much more will God give us himself when we ask? We need to be people who are filled with the power of God that we wouldn't be hyper in this culture that's trying to pull us in every direction theologically and spiritually, but we would be so sustained by the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that is the only thing we do have. If you have ever been moved by anything I've ever said, if you've ever come to church and thought, man, that sermon hit me, if you've ever worshiped God from the bottom of your heart because of a song, it is because the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, this is a book club and these are songs. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm just giving you man's wisdom and words that will never penetrate the depth of your soul. But God has revealed to us through his spirit. My prayer for our church, for my life, is that I would be so in love with God that the power of his spirit sustains me. And that's what we want to do every week. Point everything to God and his power that the focus of your faith would not be in hype, but in the power of God.